I want to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to speak. Uh, it is a difficult subject to try to say who and when uh, should be doing the uh, laparoscopic pancreatic or the nectomy. Uh, but we're going to try to touch the uh, important factors and hopefully um, you'll be a little bit more familiarized for those of you that have not had the chance to be exposed to this type of procedure. I have nothing to disclose. Uh, I want to do an introductory summary because this is going to be the base of everything. It, the, the laparoscopic pancreatic odontectomy was adopted at a much lower pace and the early adopters concluded that uh, um, there was no possibility to be doing this laparoscopically. It was still confined to selected centers. It requires a high level of laparoscopic skills and there's no scientifically proof yet that its advantages justify the length and the complexity of the procedure. Then what I'm going to do today is do a little brief review of the literature. There's not much really. Um, I'm going to show you some of the good. I'm going to warn you at some of the bad, and then we'll try to touch the subject who and when. The earlier experience was by Ganier back in 1994 and Cuchieri. They both started more or less at the same time. And up to of the 13 patients that were published in the literature, the conclusion was they should not be done laparoscopically. I think that even though they were very skilled surgeons, it, it was early. We didn't have the skills that we have now. And at the same time, the, the optics and the instrumentation was not as good as it is now. Husher also had a series, but with very bad results. This is the first paper that really put this back in the map. In spite of there were some surgeons doing it in the early 2000s. Um, 2007, Palani Velu from India showed 45 patients, very good results. And what it did is it stimulated um, Dr. Kendrick, who is at, in Rochester, and he took the ball and ran with it. He did a great job, has probably the largest, he, he does have now the largest experience in the world. And this was his series, 62 patients, published in 2010. Very good results, too. A brief summary of what it is now in the literature uh, for uh, the, pay, the series of more than 30 patients. Um, it's a pretty busy slide, but let me try to concentrate a little bit. The estimated blood loss is much less. That's a real advantage of the procedure. Um, in every single series, apparently, the, uh, when they compare it to open, the estimated blood loss is less. I skip the OR time on purpose. The OR time is much longer, of course. Um, the R0 resection was very decent. The majority of the series is above 90%. The pancreatic fistula rate varies from 6 to 21%. But this is really what it is reflected also for open cases. And uh, this is only B and C. Not in, it does not include A. The length of hospital stay, of course, we know it's going to be low. Morbidity and mortality, very decent. Um, uh, you see that ranges between 26 and 56 percent. The two series that did by Clavian score was one by Sa and Say, and the other one at my institution by myself and my partner, Dr. Stoffer. Then this proved that really it's very feasible. Let's talk a little bit more briefly about a comparison that we did in our experience. Um, again, with my partner, Dr. Stoffer, uh, who had implemented, we implemented it a database, and we keep it um, up to date. It's a prospective maintained database. From 2008 to 2011, we had done 53 patients, and we wanted a historical comparison with other expert pancreatic open surgeons compared to 217 patients. There were no significant difference in demographics or indications. I'm just going to concentrate on very few aspects of that series. It, it is published in the Journal of American College of Surgeons. The gastric emptying study, there was, there was no delay in gastric emptying, um, uh, more than an, than an open. There was no significance. The delay was 11.3 versus 15.3. And uh, B and C, um, quite similar, between 8 and 9 percent. The fistula, which is the, major, the, the, the key point of, of this procedure, is how do you do the anastomosis? And a lot of people have trouble thinking that we can do this laparoscopically. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time. The fistula rate is quite good. Um, it's still not as we would like to see it, but it was around 9.5% in our series, 9% in the open. The review since then, between 2008 and 2012, um, 2009 to 2012, uh, that uh, um, the, the fistula rate has maintained around 10%. Why is this? 
And this is how we can do the anastomosis. And we have changed our technique from the very early years. I, I did it in 2002. Now we do it with um, the 5 or 6.0, depending the duct, usually 5.0 because it's an ophthalmologic needle. You can see the duct is a very small duct. We're using a 3.5 French tube, what it is, a 1.3 millimeters. Then you can really visualize the duct very well, angle the needle, and be able to put each stitch under direct visualization. Um, we have modified and we do a little larger opening on the bowel now. Um, because we feel that uh, in, in the opening should hug the duct. In the past, we used to do it more or less the same size, but you see here is larger than the 1.3. And we put several interrupted stitches, as we would do it in an open. Um, the manipulation of the needle with these small needle drivers is much more um, manageable than with the larger needle drivers. This is a 3-millimeter needle driver um, that allows us for a good angulation of the needle. And you can put each stitch under the visualization, seeing that you purchase a small amount of mucosa. And I'm not going to bore you with the rest, but this is basically um, how we can do the anastomosis, in, in, and we do this now routinely. And this technique, you can teach it. It is not necessary to mandatorily do it with the robot. Then let's talk a little bit about who should it do it. Who should do it? There are two main components in my view. One is commitment, and the other one is training. Um, commitment because it will take a significant effort. It, and, you, and the person that wants to learn has to have the investment in doing it well. You need to keep in mind the patient is first, and you need to constantly assess your results. And even though it sounds a little bit silly to say it, one needs to avoid being drawn by the novelty or the macho feeling, and I say macho feeling including male and female this time, because the macho feeling of, yes, I can do a Whipple, now it has translated, oh, I can do a Whipple laparoscopically. Well, we need to avoid that, and we need to keep in mind that safety is more important. The training is crucial that the surgeon he has a background in pain care surgery, and this has been a controversial. A lot of laparoscopic surgeons jumped in without having the training of pain care surgery, and at the same time, it's crucial that you have advanced laparoscopic skills, and you need to study the techniques, the details of the techniques, and this video-based education is very good. And when I say video-based education, it means to your own cases. After each case, or if you are being trained with your mentor, review the videos, edit them, you're going to get familiarized with the steps and why some things work better than others. This is how we have done it. We used to talk with Michael Kendricks about the 10,000 hours. If you put 10,000 hours in some skill, and many of you have read the book, says that's when you accomplish um, the experience. This is probably uh, true for this procedure. A little bit word about robotics. There are the advantages that are clear, shortened learning curve for experienced HPV surgeons, but there are disadvantages. Cost, and then you end depending on technology. And that's what has happened with the, to the urologist. To me, it has curtailed the urologist to be able to get, be better laparoscopic surgeons. Because once you learn with a robot that's faster and easier, you think, well, you know, why do I need to learn more? And you don't push yourself more. And I think that if you push yourself, you're going to be surprised of what you can do. And a little word of caution about the robot. It is not about the robot. We have now seen a lot of complications. Yesterday I was talking with a surgeon that in his hometown there have been two deaths due to robotic pancreatic duodenectomies. And it may shorten the parts of the learning curve, but don't cut the corners in commitment, training, and effort. And even though among us we really don't know what's going on, the lawyers got it. If you can see, if you Google the words robot and injury, now there's a serious of lawyers that they call themselves Da Vinci robot surgery. Um, and it, it is surprising. You go into these pages and you'll be surprised. This is what they say. They have the logos and even the, the, the drawings of the Da Vinci robot. It tells you that in, in certain situations can cause complications or death. In other ones, they, it, they say that different surgical methods that did not involve the Da Vinci robot could have been used, and that is a cause for suing. And obviously, in any laparoscopic procedure you do, you could have done it open. In any robotic procedure you do, you could have done it open laparoscopically. They go even further. These are from those sites. They say that the lack of training and regulation can potentially lead to dangerous complications when inexperienced surgeons operate on unsuspected patients. Then be careful with uh, just jumping 
to the, in doing this because you have a robot. And we're under a lot of pressure by marketing and by our administrators that have bought plenty of robots and they don't know what else to use it besides the urology, for, besides urology or GYN. Um, this is not robotic, but um, this is some bleeding. Just in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this one. I'm going to show you this other one that's a little bit more difficult. Um, the other one was easier to control. This one, um, this doesn't happen often, but it can happen, and that's where you have to really work on it. You, we're under the neck of the pancreas. This is very unusual, but this patient was morbidly obese, and there was a branch, what appeared to be a branch, but we weren't sure if it was a branch or not. And uh, believe me, we did repair it and stop the bleeding. <laughs> I'll have to skip it. Now let's talk a little bit about when. When should it be done? It is a difficult answer because what is easy for the laparoscopic resection cases gives you a difficult reconstruction. The small tumor that it is isolated, that is not close to the veins, is going to give you usually a soft pancreas and a very small duct. On the other hand, the big tumor that obstructs the duct is going to give you pancreatitis and it's going to be more difficult for the resection. Ideally, you would say, well, I want to have one for um, I want to have an ampullary tumor and a big duct. We don't see that very often anymore. Uh, it is related, directly related to the skill level of the person performing it, therefore it's difficult to answer when. Portent vein involvement is, an, is, is a clear contraindication for a lot of, of the centers and a lot of people that are doing this. We used to do them, um, we, we started doing them, but we realized that it takes us longer to cross clamp, to, to repair, to do a reconstruction when we have to close, close clamp the portal vein. And I didn't find a justification not to open and submit the patient for a longer cross clamp. However, we do uh, side um, resections of portal vein and um, Michael Kendrick, again, he has published a series of portal vein resections. Then um, the jury is not completely out, but at present, if we know we're gonna have to do a graft, we don't do it laparoscopically. And in our practice, patients' preference is important. A lot of patients come and insist, and they came to our center only to do a laparoscopically. Well, on those, you need to try as long as you don't think that you're compromising the quality or the safety for the procedure. And time availability. We have a lot of patients from out of town. They arrive, and yes, to do a seven or eight hour case, um, currently our cases are between six and eight hours. A laparoscopically, is much different than to do a two and a half to four hour case open then we offer the patient, if you want to do it sooner, we're going to do it um, tomorrow, next week. If not, you have to wait two weeks. And therefore, there are no scientific um, reasons to know when. What I can tell you, though, is has it, the procedure matured to be the new standard for everybody? Absolutely not. It will take some time to prove it. However, is the technique safe, feasible, and ready for showtime? Yes. And for those that are committed to do this, we need to find out. We need to find out what is what we're going to do. Does it make sense? Well, this is key. We need to overcome the idea that we're doing pancreatic odontectomies to obtain a smaller incision or shave a couple of days from the length of hospital stay. That is not why we're doing it. Because in a pancreatic odontectomy, that is not that important. We're doing it to see if we can improve the quality of life, if we can get these patients earlier to chemotherapy, if we can actually do a better operation laparoscopically. Many of you are going to tell me, well, how is this going to be a better operation, oncologic or not? Believe it or not, it may result after a, some period of time, we may be able to show a difference. And that's why, because, and, and when do you decide to do it then? You need to think on a member of your family. Again, that sounds, may, they may sound cheesy, but it's true. When you're going to be very excited to do a laparoscopic whipple and you say, well, if this will be a member of my family, and as I always say, you have to think on a member of your family that you like then you do it, well, are you going to do it laparoscopic or open? And that helps you make the decision. <clears throat> and there's no longer room to do it by yourself. Now there are very well-established centers where it's a standard operation, and I think that may not be that responsible to uh, start doing it like we did it many years ago when there was no one that we could go on and look at it and, and look the technique. Uh, we know all the strengths of the operation, better manipulation, etc. but uh, let me just show you a couple of... of um, of things that we do. This is going to be shown by um, Dr. Stoffer, my partner. But laparoscopically, we have learned that you can identify the small pancreatic duct and you can take two or three millimeters that facilitates you the, lapar the, the anastomosis. The technique and how it's going to be done is going to be described by Dr. Stoffer on Saturday morning. 
We do uh, oncologic principles, we have a radial margin, and we believe that maybe in the future we're going to be able to prove that this is a result is similar to the mesorectal excision, that you do a sharp dissection and direct, direct visualization, and this is what you get. This is, not, this is a case we did on Friday. Um, this is not something unusual. We can clear posteriorly significantly and do it under direct visualization. Is this important or not? It's going to take time to, think, to, to prove. Uncinate margin, you can see the supremacenteric vein and supremacenteric artery without a problem. Then, can we provide better outcomes? It better, because if we cannot prove that we can provide better outcomes, I'll stop doing them. It's, you know, it takes a long time to do it, a lot of effort. Uh, it will take time to prove it, and we need to look into it. It's here and established, likely to stay in some way or form. In conclusion, laparoscopic pancreatic duodenectomy is being done with the end goal of performing a better operation. It is feasible, and the results are encouraging. But definitely we need further series and need to assess if the procedure will show advantages that make the effort worthwhile for everybody to apply. I have to say in some centers, though, even though selectors around the world, this is a standard of, of, uh, to be performed. Thank you very much. Thanks. It's great to be here today, and I'm glad to see everyone here instead of uh, on the beach. So thanks for coming. This is a difficult topic because there's a lot of grayness in the decision making and I hope I'll outline that for you here. This is a CT scan of a patient we'd all love to see, a nice pancreatic head mass with a preserved fat plane on the SMV and is clearly a resectable pancreatic cancer. But more and more commonly we're all seeing borderline resectable and locally advanced patients. And I present this as a case example. This is July 2004, a patient of mine, and I hope you can see the loss of fat plane along the SMA laterally and over the superior aspect of the SMA. And this patient presented really before the definition of borderline resectable disease uh, was established. He had a biopsy-proven pancreatic cancer, went on to an ECOG protocol at that time, which was gemcitabine oxaliplatin, followed by gem uh, radiotherapy. Seven months later, still continued to have this uh, tissue along the SMA, but no evidence of progressive disease in distant sites. And so we resected him, and he was found to have a 2.5 centimeter adenocarcinoma. I took tissue right along the SMA, which was margin negative, and he had a significant radiation effect. And of course, the reason to present this case is he's now currently NED 8.5 years after diagnosis. And it's just a testament to the fact that aggressive multimodality therapy can result in occasional wins for these patients. So I want to talk about a couple of things. What is, what is the definition, as we understand it now, of borderline disease and locally advanced disease? And I want to talk a little bit about one of my favorite topics. What is the accuracy of preoperative imaging? We'll talk about some therapy options for these patients and then a little bit about prognosis. So obviously this category of borderline resectable lesions has been a category that, a definition that's been in evolution, really started the terminology probably in 2004 by the NCCN, but then I think really pioneered by the MD Anderson group, Matt Katz and others, who defined in 2006 what anatomically was defined as borderline resectable type A lesions. And then I think the society has to be very proud of its efforts from ASCO GI in 2008, in which the consensus conference defined uh, borderline resectable, and that was then adopted by NCCN. So when you look at these definitions, the things that are similar are abutment, less than 180 degree involvement of the SMA, abutment or encasement of the common hepatic artery, and occlusion of the SMV portal vein that's reconstructible. But where these definitions differ is in abutment of the celiac artery, which is included in the Anderson definition. And then, of course, the very controversial topic of vein involvement. Does any degree of vein involvement warrant a definition of borderline resectable? And according to the consensus statement by Calorie and by, adopted by the NCCN, it does. So this is important just because when we look at the results of these series, it, the results vary a little bit depending on what definition is utilized. This is clearly in contrast to the patients with locally advanced unresectable disease where they have encasement of the SMA, celiac, or common hepatic artery, and this is a patient of mine who clearly had encasement of the celiac, the common hepatic, the splenic arteries involved, and this SMV portal vein is gone for a portion of its length, clearly locally advanced disease. So preoperative imaging, I really believe, is one of the most important advances in the treatment of HPB malignancies in general and clearly pancreas cancers because it allows us to really see what it is we're doing. We can really enhance the assessment of vascular involvement and obviously see small volume metastatic disease that I think we could not in the past. For this reason, we are taking fewer patients to the operating room that we cannot resect, so it's improved the resectability rate. 
And then I think also over time, the slow improvement in medial survi median survival is because we are not operating on patients with small volume metastatic disease. So I think it increases the safety of the operation because we're prepared to do vascular resections in those patients that need it, and it's selecting the right patients for surgery. And this is because, obviously, this issue of margin assessment is so important in the margin along the SMV, SMA and portal vein SMV. So the question is, we, this is immensely important to the imaging technology that we have available now, but there are still clearly limitations in our ability to detect venous involvement. And this is a great study from Dave's group at WASH U looking at 340 patients, of which the use of neoadjuvant therapy was very small in this group. There were three uh, things evaluated, abutment, fat plane, obliteration, and narrowing or beaking of the vein. And, and then what uh, was done in this study was to look at those that required vein resection and go back and look at these scans. And what was found then, of those that required vein resection, only 60% had one of these signs, showing that there is clearly some limitation to our ability to accurately assess whether these patients truly have borderline resectable disease or not. Interestingly, Matt... Katz and the group from Anderson just recently put out a paper in cancer in 2012, and for any of you who have seen the Anderson presentations, the imaging is just fantastic. The pancreas protocol CT, and we live in envy of those images that they're getting routinely at Anderson. So you may be surprised to see what the limitations are here. These are 129 patients with borderline resectable tumors defined by the consensus definition, which then included 43% of patients that had SMV portal vein involvement, all had neoadjuvant therapy. But when you look at this series, only 60% required vascular resection, of which 95% had complete clearance, which is fantastic. But again, saying that there are some limitations in our ability to tell which patients are going to ultimately need vascular resection. The Vanderbilt Group, Nippon Merchants Group, looked at the same issue and asked the question, if you add EUS to CT, does it improve accuracy? And if you look at this, if you looked at any involvement of the vein by either method, it was still only 67% accurate. So I leave this just to say there are still clearly limitations. We're defining patients as borderline resectable or locally advanced based on the imaging tests available to us, but there are still limitations in what information we get out of that and how accurate it is. This is important because I think on univariate analysis and other multivariate analysis that I'll show you later in the talk, there's no difference in overall survival whether you need a vein resection or not. But the issue of margin clearance is immensely important in looking at the prognosis for these patients, which gets us to the question of you know, the rationale for neoadjuvant therapy. And obviously, this is well known to this audience. It increases the number of patients, clearly, who will receive the therapy. And, and just as I showed you in that first case example, very, very rarely do we have wins with this disease with surgery alone. I think we increasingly have relied on multimodality therapy. And if you believe patients need chemotherapy or radiation therapy, there clearly is a significant percentage of patients, maybe 20 to 30 percent, that will not get it because they have prolonged recovery from uh, surgery. Likely, it improves the rate of R0 resection, but the struggle, trouble, trouble with the data for borderline resectable disease, well, for, for any uh, use of neoadjuvant therapy, is there's no prospective randomized data to prove this. And then, of course, the issue of natural history and really selecting the patients while they're getting their neoadjuvant therapy that actually have early metastatic disease. And in patients with resectable disease, only about 70% of patients actually end up getting their operation, primarily because they manifest early metastatic lesions. So if we try to apply those principles to patients with borderline resectable tumors and look at the currently available data, these are the series that, that I found. And I will say um, it's really important to look at what definition was used. Most of them used the consensus definition, but um, the MD Anderson anatomically defined uh, lesions were also utilized. And if you look at the two um, uh, series from Anderson, one uses the consensus definition, one uses the anatomically resectable um, type A lesions. And you can see the differences in the resectability rate based on the definition that was used. Um, so if you look at overall the resectability rate ranging from 40 to 66 percent, most of these patients dropped out because they did manifest early metastatic lesions. The, the vast majority of them were the reasons they didn't get resected. And so this does allow for selection of the right patients for operation. 
The R0 rate is really impressive, and I think this is impressive even in patients with resectable disease, and this is likely the result of some very aggressive neoadjuvant therapy, most of which use combined chemotherapy and radiation. Some use full course systemic chemotherapy followed by radiation, but this was obviously not standardized in any way. When we go on to look at these series and look at the survival, it really has varied from about 22 months to 40 months for the patients that had resections. This is taking out the group that were not resected. And I think this is clearly, clearly shows you know, what is a very um, favorable survival for this very complex group of patients. There were very few series that actually tried to compare the results of chemoradiotherapy compared to surgery, and this is one that I found from Fox Chase in 2010. And you can see that there were no differences between these two groups, 74 having chemoradiotherapy, 35 having surgery up front, no difference in the amount of number of patients that needed vein resection, a higher rate of arterial resection in the chemoradiotherapy group, Clearly a difference in the R0 group and a difference in survival, and this is the univariate survival curve from that series. And you could say, looking at these numbers, well, of course these patients need chemoradiotherapy, but I think the question is, do all of these patients, particularly with limited vein involvement, really need to have chemoradiotherapy? And in this series on multivariate analysis, when you controlled for all the other factors, only the R status and the presence of perioperative complications were associated with overall survival, not receipt of chemoradiotherapy. And so this is partly the result of controlling for other factors and realizing that didn't actually enhance overall survival in this series. Another way to look at the question of does every patient with vein involvement need upfront neoadjuvant therapy is to look at the patients that required vein resection and compare those to patients with resectable disease. And this is a series from our central pancreas consortium of nearly 500 patients, patients, none of whom had neoadjuvant therapy, so it's a very homogeneous population. 70 patients had vein resection. And we look at, on the multivariate analysis of predictors of overall survival, the usual things that you would think are, should be associated with survival are tumor grade, lymph nodes, R1 margin status, the EBL, and the receipt of adjuvant chemotherapy. But whether or not patients needed a vein resection was not did not um, alter their survival. And so in this uniform population, none of whom had neoadjuvant therapy, there was no difference in overall sur survival between resectable patients and those that required vein resection up front. And so I think there is still some question about whether the, all of these patients need to have neoadjuvant therapy. In those in which you're considering neoadjuvant therapy, I think the question also is, should they get chemotherapy, combined therapy, or both? And I think these are clearly complementary therapies. This is a typical schema from the Anderson group looking at using systemic chemotherapy up front, primarily because nearly all of these patients have micrometastatic disease, and then saving the radiation for a later phase for those that don't drop out. And I think we have to at least ask the question, should this scheme be used for everyone, or are there differences in what the goals that we're trying to achieve for patients with venous versus arterial involvement? Clearly, this conversation has become more complex since the Fulfirinox versus gemcitabine trial came out, uh, which showed an unprecedented over four-month improvement in survival for patients having Fulfirinox, and these are patients with metastatic disease. Obviously, this is tempered by the greater toxicity in the patients receiving fulfirinox, but this has been really applied to many patients now with locally advanced and um, borderline resectable tumors. Conroy, who published the previous trial, has an e-publication out just this last month which summarizes the series of patients getting fulfirinox for borderline disease and for locally advanced disease. And you can see that the number of series is four for borderline resectable, nine for locally advanced disease, and you can see the number of patients. Um, the response rate in the locally advanced group was about a third, which is what we would expect it to be, and the resectability rate, 73% and 24% for these two groups, was very reasonable. These were early reports, and so the median survival, I think, still remains to be determined, and many of these patients that got resected had radiation before therapy as well. I think the, re, reminding ourselves of the toxicity really can't overstate the fact that it's the select patient who can actually get fulfirinox. 28% of patients had hematologic grade 3 and 4 toxicities, and 34% ended up getting hospitalized during therapy. 
That being said, I think our medical oncologists are getting a little more savvy about giving these drugs and have found that if you can dose attenuate the bolus 5 a few in the Irona TCAN and give growth factor support that we probably can decrease the toxicity of this combination. And so we'll see more series looking at that in the future. I will say because the data that I have showed you so far would tell us we don't have any clear answer to this question, I have to put a plug in for Matt Katz and Cy Ahmed's uh, trial that has been many years in the making, should probably open next month. It's the Alliance trial looking at patients with borderline resectable cancer in which induction therapy is given with four cycles of fulfirinox followed by combination chemoradiotherapy with capecitabine for those that don't progress. Patients then get resected and then go on to adjuvant therapy. And this is an early feasibility study just trying to prove whether patients can be accrued at a rapid rate. But if this does occur, this will go on to a larger trial. <clears throat> so in conclusion, clearly the data is all over the place. We don't have good data to tell us what the right answer is. And I think ideally all patients should be enrolled in a trial. Of course, not all of us always have trials open for these patients. And so I'd like to leave with some suggestions. For borderline resectable disease, I think it's a different whether there is a small amount of vein abutment in which you could easily perform a tangential resection on the vein. I think these patients, clearly you could make an argument for neoadjuvant combined radiotherapy, or I think there still is a, not a clear argument that upfront surgery is the wrong answer. For greater degrees of vein involvement, encasement, occlusion, or arterial abutment, these patients, I think, absolutely should get chemoradiotherapy or systemic therapy followed by combination therapy to really allow an assessment of the natural history of the disease. And I think that same therapy should be recommended for those that have locally advanced disease since only a small fraction of these will become resectable. Thank you. So acute uh, pancreatitis, we're changing track slightly. Um, there's no doubt it can range anything from a very mild self-limiting disease to one that has uh, very severe life-threatening consequences. Uh, approximately one in every four patients will develop either these local complications or end organ dysfunction. And that accounts for the very high mortality for this otherwise described benign disease. It led Lord Moynihan, one of the forefathers of British surgery, to, 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 to state that it was indeed the most terrible of all calamities that can occur in connection with the abdominal viscera. End organ effects such as damage to the lungs, uh, the heart or the kidneys can indeed have significant consequences, but it's the local complications where we may be able to, to make uh, some advances in terms of our management. That can be drainage of local abscesses or collections of pus, the management of acute fluid collections, and probably the most challenging area dealing with necrosis, and particularly when that necrosis becomes infected. Now, we're not going to go into the details of all the management options, but focusing on infected pancreatic necrosis, we can diagnose that by radiological evidence of gas within the collection. Uh, some centres may still do FNA bacteriology, although that has been done less and less now. And there's the clinical picture of ongoing deterioration with clinical signs and symptoms of sepsis. Now, the conventional open operative technique required a big incision, bilateral subcostal incision, drainage of the lesser sac collection, taking samples for bacteriological culture, aspiration of any liquefied material, and then a blunt debridement of the necrotic tissue. Feed patients could have a feeding jejunostomy, uh, drainage of their stomach uh, to avoid delayed gastric emptying, and then the wound could either be closed or left open, you could insert drains, you could set up a lavage system, or you could pack the cavity and go back and re-explore. Plenty of options. These are some typical images entering the lesser sac through the infracolic compartment, aspirating and sucking out the liquefied pus, and using blunt debridement to take away the tissue, uh, the necrotic pancreatic and peripancreatic tissue. And this is the typical picture that you would get at the end of such a procedure. The patient in our uh, hands, we usually close the wound, set up an irrigation system with large drains into the peripancreatic bed uh, and irrigated these cavities with uh, solution. Feeding jejunostomy, the mainstay of ongoing nutrition. Quite a significant insult for these patients and they often required prolonged periods in the intensive care unit. The alternative was to leave uh, the wound open, a laparostomy, which allowed even in the ICU setting to go in and wash out the cavity, wash out the, the pancreatic bed. 
What percentage of patients require such a procedure? Well, when we reviewed over 1,200 patients, there was only 94 that actually needed a necrosectomy, just over 7% of the patients. So it is a very small percentage of these patients. But the mortality rate was still significant. One in four patients almost who required a necrosectomy did not survive or, or leave hospital. Around uh, the turn of the, the millennium, uh, Ross Carter and colleagues from Glasgow published their first series of 14 patients who had a minimal approach to draining uh, the pus and to dealing with the, the pancreatic necrosis. And they described percutaneous necrosectomy and sinus tract endoscopy. And you can see they had one patient who required conversion at the initial procedure because of bleeding. In general, patients needed more than one procedure. Their median was three procedures to go back and redrain and redebride the, the region. But they noticed a significant and dramatic reduction in the requirements for ICU management, a similar length of stay, but no change in their mortality rate. Still a, a, a significant mortality rate even in these patients. Since then, and, and there have been various minimally invasive approaches described and well recognized, a laparoscopic transperitoneal uh, approach, endoscopic transgastric approach, but still probably the most widely practiced being a percutaneous retroperitoneal approach, which can be termed in, in various ways, minimally invasive, retroperitoneal pancreatic necrosectomy, minimal access retroperitoneal uh, pancreatic necrosectomy, or uh, video-assisted retroperitoneal debridement, lots of terminology. In our own practice, we use a, a modified nephroscope uh, and use this percutaneous retroperitoneal approach. Typically, and this is the, our procedure, we work in collaboration with our radiologists. The patient goes down to the radiology department and has a guide wire inserted, ideally in the left flank, in between the, the left kidney and the spleen, getting access into the lesser sac cavity. The patient can then be taken to the operating theatre and the track is uh, dilated up. Uh, the next stage is then to, to get the nephroscope in uh, and to remove the necrotic material. And you can see the typical way that this is done. Uh, under direct vision, the necrotic dead grey usually material can be grasped with simple graspers and, and taken out through the track. You can see the brown black material that uh, is really evidence of the necrotic tissue. Everything being visualized in theater on a monitor. The next thing is then just to leave a, a wide bore catheter, big drain with a small uh, parallel placed um, feeding tube which is used to irrigate the cavities through, through a single incision a large drain, but irrigating constantly to wash out the cavity, help break up any uh, residual material, and then the patient can be taken back for repeat procedures if needed. CT monitoring, either um, on a, a planned basis or on a regular basis with tubograms, can show the cavity contracting down, the drain can be withdrawn and eventually removed when the cavity has collapsed. Probably one of the largest series is from our colleagues in Liverpool. They uh, reported 189 patients in a single institution over a 10, 11 year period. You can see two thirds of their patients were tertiary referrals. So these are all very sick uh, end stage, uh, severe acute pancreatitics. And they show a very typical um, appearance of what the practice has been in many UK centers in the last decade. You can see in dark bars, the number of open procedures and over the years, gradually reducing, but not down to zero. The light gray bars, increasing use of minimal access techniques, was still a small need for, small need for conversions from laparoscopic to, or, or for minimally invasive minimal access techniques to an open procedure. And this would be very typical uh, of certainly our own practice. Still a small requirement for an open procedure. Now they, and it was just in a case controlled, uh, not in a randomized fashion, but they uh, compared their outcomes from minimal access uh, and open procedures. The demographic data, there was no difference between the two groups. In their preoperative uh, markers and data, there was no significant difference. The minimal access group had a slightly lower uh, median Apache score, but otherwise there was no significant data difference in the data preoperatively. But postoperatively, they noted a significantly higher incidence of patients who had an open procedure, had multi-organ failure. 
uh, they had a significantly higher mortality rate in the open group uh, and, and uh, a significant higher percentage of their patients requiring ICU care. Uh, perhaps indirect evidence that the patients requiring open surgery had a much significant or a much more severe second hit with this major operation. When they looked at univariate uh, analysis of outcomes counting towards death, the minimal access was uh, associated with a much lower risk of death uh, following this procedure. And this was maintained in a multivariate logistic regression where minimal access uh, approaches resulted in a lower uh, risk of death. But they did still require open procedures in some patients. Uh, and these uh, were 19 out of their 137 patients, approximately 14%. And the reasons you can see are listed there. Six, because of an inability to place the guide wire or get access. Uh, they stated that was predominantly in their early experience. There was a small group who bled, some who had remote or inaccessible collections, and then a group who developed other complications, predominantly associated with colonic necrosis or ischemia or fistula requiring further intervention. So they still described a need for some open procedures. That was a single institution, but a retrospective case studies. This is the only randomized trial comparing a form of minimal access surgery to open surgery produced by the, uh, the Dutch group. A multi-center study, they looked at a step-up procedure where they started with just percutaneous drainage. If needed, they moved on to video-assisted debridement and compared that to those who were randomized to an open procedure. Their primary endpoint was a composite, uh, quite a complex composite of uh, complications or death. And you can see that 69% of the patients requiring open procedure hit their endpoint, whereas only 40% of those who had the step up uh, management. So their outcomes where they felt the step up uh, approach was a better one. There was no difference in mortality. But in the step-up group, there was a reduced incidence of multi-organ failure, lower rate of incisional hernias, and a lower rate of diabetes in long-term follow-up. What was interesting that a third of their patients in the step-up group only required percutaneous drainage and did not require any debridement or subsequent uh, video-assisted uh, debridement. But they still had this requirement for open surgery. Two out of the 26 did require a laparotomy. So their concept was that they could start with percutaneous drainage if required. A third of the patients, that was all that would needed. If that didn't work, then they proceeded to video-assisted retroperitoneal debridement, but accepted that there was a small need for open procedures in a few selected circumstances. The same Dutch group have also uh, accumulated quite a wide um, database of from 21 hospitals of prospectively collected data over a four or five year period. Over 600 patients who had peripancreatic or pancreatic necrosis. And this was their flu diagram. And what I just would pick out is those that still did require an open operation. Out of the 639, there were 32 or 5% that needed an early emergency laparotomy. Of those that required debridement, there was a number who initially went through and had percutaneous primary catheter drainage, but a further 25 of those still required an open procedure. And again, those who didn't have a catheter but went straight to an intervention in this prospectively collected data, another group who just went straight to laparotomy. Overall, about 20% of the patients in this time period in their hands needed open surgery. 5% because of an acute abdominal catastrophe in the early stages of the disease, predominantly due to either abdominal compartment syndrome or bile ischemia. And of that group, there was a very high mortality, 78% mortality. But they also had a group that required a late laparotomy, usually because of failure of percutaneous or, or video-assisted um, procedures. So in summary, indications for intervention I think it's widely accepted that uh, you only need to intervene in those who have infected necrosis. That may be based on radiological imaging, but is usually uh, determined by significant clinical deterioration and signs of sepsis. If possible, intervention should be delayed as long as possible. We haven't gone into all the evidence base for that, 
but week three, week four is certainly much more advantageous than having to intervene earlier. And therefore, maintaining these patients with uh, conservative means and uh, close collaboration with the intensivist is really important over these early phases. But for those that do require intervention, the current thinking was percutaneous drainage may well be the first and only uh, step required. And certainly in about a third of the patients, that, that might be the only treatment needed. Of those that need additional debridement of peripancreatic necrosis, uh, the consensus now is moving towards much more minimally invasive approaches, and certainly in our hands, percutaneously doing this um, it is preferable to laparoscopic or endoscopic approaches. But there is still a small requirement for open uh, procedures, and those are those patients who predominantly get an acute catastrophe where you're concerned about bile ischemia, bile perforation, uh, or some other abdominal uh, catastrophe. And there may also be those who have inaccessible or very difficultly located um, collections that can be difficult to drain percutaneously. And, and therefore, probably in about 10 to 15% of patients, there may still be a requirement for an open procedure. Thank you. Many topics, uh, when we talk about surgical decision making, we're not limited uh, by high quality randomized controlled data. Uh, so for the next 10 or 15 minutes, I'm going to describe really our approach uh, to patients uh, with these processes, and I'd certainly be happy to entertain any questions uh, at the end. So I don't know if any of you outside of New York uh, follow the much uh, or the very competitive uh, New Yorker caption contest, um, but Dr. Uh, Jarnigan, my boss, is quite dismayed when he comes into my office on my academic day and sees me uh, working on this caption contest. <laughs> um, and and this, this was my caption that I submitted for this cartoon about a year ago. <laughs> and I think that uh, this sums up uh, what I have to say about cystic disease of the pancreas, or at least for the vast majority of patients that we see with this problem. And that is that we see patients with one, two, three, four, or even five bigger problems uh, in, with regards to their health than that one centimeter cyst that was detected on a CT scan done for the sprained ankle uh, in the emergency department. And I think we have to be very careful when we manage these patients uh, to see the forest uh, for the trees. Now, we uh, thought, and I think that certainly the majority of the current literature suggests that most people are taking a selective approach to resection in patients who present with cystic lesions. I used to quote this uh, 1995 uh, article, uh, which, which did recommend a routine resection. And I think at that time, the majority of patients, and certainly in the 1970s, 1980s, and early 90s, were being identified with large symptomatic lesions. If you go back to the early histopathologic results from the AFIP uh, by Companio and Ortel, you see patients with very large tumors, uh, mucinous lesions that had undergone malignant progression, and that operative resection in that setting was certainly warranted. However, I think even now we see uh, articles which suggest uh, that routine resection should continue. Uh, the, uh, the quote at the bottom is from a study uh, published this summer uh, in patients undergoing resection for branch duct IPMN, and, and they do list the criteria, eligibility criteria for resection, and they, they quoted the uh, Sendai uh, criteria, and then at the end they also said that even in those patients with cyst sizes less than three centimeters without suspicious features were offered surgical resection when they were fit patients, and actually the smallest branch duct IPMN resected in this, pa this paper was four millimeters uh, in size. I think we have to remember when we're evaluating these patients that we're, and what I'm talking about right now, at least is a cystic lesion, not a histopathologic entity. We do still struggle uh, with that diagnosis uh, on occasion. And as we know, this finding can really span the histopathologic spectrum from completely benign lesions, such as serous cystadenoma, uh, retention cysts, if you will, to malignant lesions, and then in the middle, uh, we have these lesions, IPMN, as well as mucinous cystic neoplasms, which are significantly less common, but really IPMN being the, the, the horse here that we have to deal with. And, and I would argue that if we could define these very clearly, 
uh, without an operation, then there would not be much argument. I think we would agree to monitor the benign lesions, resect the cancerous ones, and then we would argue about which ones of the pre-malignant lesions should undergo resection and which ones should be observed and in which patients. So I would say that currently our approach is a selective one and that that balance uh, between operation, and, excuse me, observation and resection is based on the certainty of the histopathologic diagnosis, what we believe the natural history of that specific lesion is, whether it's causing symptoms, what is the exact risk to the patient? Is the patient 40 years old with a strong family history or are they 82 years old with 10 stents and having just had two heart attacks? And then what's the risk of the operation? Is it a pancreatic duodenectomy or is it a lesion in the very tail of the gland? And based on that, we tailor our decisions uh, based on those factors. And to present a very brief case with one slide. This would be a 58-year-old patient that I saw in 2008. She had an eight millimeter cystic lesion in the head of the pancreas. Somebody recommended an EUS with an FNA and, and aspiration with a cis fluid CEA of 350. And so this gives us the information that we need. Uh, the radiographic imaging, eight millimeters, there were no nodules within it. There was no pancreatic or biliary ductal dilatation. The patient was asymptomatic, no strong family history. And we had the cis fluid CEA of 350, which really defines this almost uh, certainly as a branch duct IPMN. And, and we elected, or I elected, to observe her. And if anyone would, uh, would uh, recommend otherwise, we can certainly go into the case in more detail uh, afterwards. These lesions are becoming, uh, a, having real clinical impact, uh, on, certainly on our practice, and, I'm, and I am sure on yours. Uh, this is just a bar graph of our resections by year for patients with carcinoma and non-carcinoma. And I will just tell you that the vast majority of these non-carcinoma patients are cystic lesions. There are some endocrine tumors in here. I haven't pulled those out. Those have remained relatively constant. But you can see that now the number of resections that we perform annually ha is greater for non-carcinoma than it is for carcinoma. And the majority of these patients have IPMN, serous cystadenoma, and, and, and other lesions. We actually just looked into getting a, a nurse practitioner in our clinics because just in our group, in our HPB group, our annual number of clinic visits for cystic lesions of the pancreas is over 2,500 visits. Uh, so this has become having a real impact on our clinical practices. I'm sure it is yours. And, and certainly, the more we can learn about how to manage these patients, uh, the better. What we did do, uh, because we do see a lot of these patients, is develop a cyst registry, and I would encourage uh, you to do similarly, because we've learned a great deal uh, from this. This registry we have actually includes any patient who a surgeon or gastroenterologist sees in the office and labels as having a pancreatic cyst, and we use the labeling through billing codes. Uh, the billing code 577.2 is pancreatic cyst or pseudocyst. Uh, we do not see a great deal of pseudocysts being a, the, uh, a, a cancer center, so certainly this identifies uh, our patients with, with cystic neoplasms primarily. Uh, Sebastian Gaujot, one of our research fellows, did a recent review on this, uh, published in 2011 with, of 1,424 patients. Uh, we now have well over 2,000 patients in this registry, and as you can see for patients in this registry, and as you can see, for our initial approach for these lesions is typically to follow them. Uh, we have now over 1,000 patients who are in radiographic follow-up for cystic lesions of the pancreas. Roughly a third of patients at presentation, when we define them as having a cyst, uh, underwent resection. Essentially, all of our patients undergo CT imaging. Uh, roughly two-thirds of them have an MRI. We utilize EUS and FNA in roughly uh, half of the patients, but I think that number is actually continues to decrease slightly. We had an initial interest in PET imaging. However, uh, we lost interest in that rather quickly as we did not uh, find any benefit in a couple of reviews when we looked at those data. And as you might imagine, uh, the blue bars represent the number of patients uh, that we've seen annually, with now about 200 patients being evaluated. And as time has gone on, the, no the size of these lesions has continued to de decrease in size, now with a median size of about 1.5 centimeters in diameter. 
the patients are less and less presenting uh, with symptoms. Now only approximately 20 or 25 percent of our patients uh, are present with symptoms, and that's defined very loosely in our registry as any uh, upper abdominal symptoms that could potentially be related uh, to the cyst. And as uh, these lesions have uh, increased in frequency, become smaller in size, and more likely to be incidental, we are less and less likely to recommend an operative approach as our initial approach. And when we look at these patients in terms of their management approach, of the 422 patients who initially underwent resection, the risk of high-grade dysplasia or an invasive lesion was 23% in that group initially resected. So some would say that's, that's good. You're, you're removing uh, in 23% of patients high-risk lesions or even invasive lesions. Uh, you need to keep in mind that 77% of those patients underwent resection for either benign lesions or low-grade lesions, and our operative mortality rate was 1% in that group. We had 719 patients of the 1,000 who had greater than six-month follow-up at the time of this review, and in that group, the vast minority, 47 patients, had developed changes that had prompted resection, and in this group, eight patients, or 1% of the total patients who we'd initially selected for surveillance, had developed adenocarcinoma. And what I would just add there to those eight patients is that about a third of those, or, or two or three of those patients, developed cancer actually in an area of the gland remote from the cyst that we were following. So had we even removed the cyst, a carcinoma uh, would have likely developed unless the total pancreatectomy had been recommended. When we compared those patients, as you might imagine, uh, similar findings to every other study that's really been presented in the literature, patients who are symptomatic uh, with larger lesions, septations, and a solid component, or pancreatic duct dilation uh, being more likely to be selected for initial resection. If we look at the patients who uh, we are following, this uh, graph presents the, the likelihood of, or the likelihood of being taken to the operating room or switching to the operative arm, and as you can see, that's a relatively low risk over time. Certainly the size of the lesion at the initial presentation was associated uh, with this finding. One of the more interesting things we discovered uh, from looking at these patients who we're selecting for radiographic surveillance, on the left you can see the risk of death from pancreatic cancer uh, in the group initially selected uh, for surveillance, and certainly as we get out to that 10-year time point, the, the confidence uh, limits are quite large. But then look at the curve on the right, and that's the risk of dying from something else uh, during this period of time. And this is the guy sitting in the, in the physician's office with five arrows sticking out of his chest. And then many of these patients who we're seeing are elderly, they have significant comorbidities, and certainly at our center with our referral bias, many of these patients have additional malignancies. So actually, greater than 50% of the patients uh, who were initially selected for sur surveillance had died of something else uh, by that 10-year time point. So I would summarize by saying that with improved uh, quality of imaging and certainly with increased utilization of cross-sectional imaging, we are finding more and more patients with cystic lesions of the pancreas. These are more often incidentally discovered. They're smaller in size. And at least for us, we are more likely to manage these patients uh, initially with radiographic surveillance. Uh, in our series, 7% of the patients managed with initial surveillance uh, developed changes prompting resection, and this was with a median follow-up of about three to four years, so still uh, not quite a uh, very mature follow-up. However, in that group of patients, carcinoma did develop in 1% of the patients who had been selected for resection. However, the risk of operative mortality uh, in those undergoing initial resection was also 1%. Uh, we do feel that non-operative management of these selected patients uh, is appropriate. We would highlight that these patients do represent a high-risk group of patients, uh, particularly the patients with IPMN. And certainly, very careful discussion of risk with either resection or surveillance is mandatory, and multidisciplinary review is certainly recommended. I'm going to highlight just in the last couple of slides that what we really feel strongly about is that we need to develop better markers uh, for dysplasia, particularly in this IPMN subgroup. And we've put a lot of effort into trying to develop both clinical as well as uh, fluid or serum markers. Uh, Camillo, I think, who's in the audience today, is going to present a recently developed nomogram at the SSO this year. 
looking at about 300 resected patients and trying to put an exact number uh, to risk of low-grade, high-grade, and invasive cancer in patients with IPMN. And certainly, we'd love to validate this in any other large uh, data sets that are available. Uh, Ajay Maker, one of our previous fellows, uh, did identify a variety of pro-inflammatory cytokines in the cis fluid, which were strongly associated with the grade of dysplasia. We've recently gone on to look at this in a much larger panel of pro-inflammatory markers and have found very similar findings, and we're very interested in pursuing this further. Actually, uh, recent modeling of the most recent uh, data on about 90 patients uh, with cis fluid from IPMN suggests that some of these markers are very strongly associated with high-grade dysplasia with an AUC, AUC or area into the curve here of about 0.86, which is certainly higher than what we would expect from standard radiographic markers, and we're certainly interested in pursuing this further. Uh, we're working uh, closely with Chris Wolfgang at Hopkins, who's leading that effort with, with Burt's group, uh, looking at genomic markers, and certainly Carlos uh, up at Mass General has also uh, been looking at a variety of protein markers uh, within the cis fluid that he's, he's also very interested in. And, and I really think that combining uh, clinical parameters as well as potential markers uh, within the cis fluid or serum will be an optimal way for us to decrease the number of patients undergoing an operation for either benign disease or low-risk IPMN. Thank you. Now, uh, I'd like to open um, the floor up for discussion. <coughs> Over here. Hi. Uh, Herb Zay from the University of Pittsburgh. I just want to address a few comments to Horatio. Thank you very much. I, I certainly enjoyed your talk. I want to focus in on the learning curve. You touched on it just very briefly, but, you know, the learning curve for open Whipple has been defined in a couple of papers, and it looks it's about 50 or 60 before you start seeing young surgeons start to plateau off in their blood loss and their outcomes. And if you look at most of the laparoscopic cases, not to serious to date, most of them haven't even really reached that. A few are over that. So I don't think enough work has been done to really say we're comparing apples and apples yet with open versus the minimally invasive technique. The second is I'm not sure that you were suggesting to any of us that we should be driving our practice patterns or evaluation of new technology based on a few unscrupulous lawyers. I'm not sure. That was a little emotive. I found those slides to be a little emotive. And then lastly, if anybody's interested, uh, on Sunday, one of our residents is going to present uh, 120 robotic Whipples with our learning curve and some of the metrics. So if you're interested on Sunday, Brian Boone will be presenting that. So thank you. Can I comment? Sure. No, thank you. And, and we are all familiarized with the great job that you have done. The, the lawyer uh, slides were more directed to those surgeons that are being pushed to use the robot at their institution and they're not doing the type of work that you have done. Then uh, um, I, I do feel that robotic or not robotic, this is something that needs to be seen, uh, look at it seriously. And that was the goal. Michael? Uh, again, directed to Horatio, that was a great, great presentation. and, and to the end of your talk, the focus on who should do it and how. Do you have any thoughts about in the next five years, what, what we can do as a society, what we can do as a group of surgeons to help foster this? Because it's still the great unanswered question. How does that surgeon who is 10 years into their practice get started in this? Um, what pathway do they take to stay away from the lawyers, but also to feel good about what they're doing? And what recommendations would you have for the fellows or potential fellows? What pathway should they take to get to where you are now? Well, you and I have talked about this before. I think that there are two main things that we need to do. First, we need to accept this as a technique that is here to stay. And I feel that uh, there's still a lot of resistance by the majority of the, um, the very good open surgeons. Um, I, I think, and that is what I stress, we need to make sure we are able to transmit the message that we're doing this to try to see if there's a better operation. And that's the first step. When there's a, once there is acceptance, um, then we can form a group of people that are really dedicated and committed to show if this is good or not. In terms of the new fellows and the, the surgeons in practice, it's two totally different um, group of people. But I think that uh, the most important thing, as I had mentioned, is commitment and the training. You need to be a very good painter surgeon as well as a very good laparoscopic surgeon. Uh, we have proven, I mean, Dr. Stoffer 
is doing laparoscopic Whipple's independently a year after, I mean, immediately after he, he graduated from his fellowship. And right now we're training a second fellow. But the key is they need to put the hours in there for uh, Mike, if you could just stand up there for a second. So, apropos to the, the comment about the lawyers and the fact that any time there's an innovative procedure in surgery that gets introduced, there's obviously a learning curve. And the question that I have for you two guys who are the pioneers is when you're starting out with something like this, how do you consent the patients? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I think uh, full disclosure. I think the patient needs to know this is your first one or your 20th one. And I would say in today's environment, whether it's robot or completely laparoscopic, maybe the first one you do shouldn't be completely laparoscopic. Maybe you should start with resection and get that down first to either a time-wise or just com being comfortable. But um, we were very uh, full disclosure with the patients um, down to we haven't done many of these. This was the first one. And you just have to consent them that way. And, you know, w with experience, it's a little easier to do that. If you've done lots of distal pancreatectomy and totals or whatever laparoscopic, it's a little bit easier to t kind of take the next version of pancreatic resection. But if, if you haven't done any pancreatic resection laparoscopic and you're consenting, that's a big deal. Do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, it's basically the same, except that um, it is very different when... Uh, we started and now I think you need to make sure that this is not the time to start doing the learning curve by yourself. You should go and try to see how the people that has been doing it has, has been able to overcome a lot of the obstacles that anybody that's going to start is going to overcome. And for the patients, I agree completely. I mean, you, you need to tell them exactly what it is, what is the experience. Even today, after having hand, done over 140 Whipple's laparoscopically, I tell them this is not the standard of care. And I explain what are the advantages and disadvantages. Thanks. Yes, Dr. Massa from Buenos Aires. Dr. Allen, I really enjoy your conference. I have some, some concerns still about the, the ideal schedule for surveillance programs. For example, if you have a 50-year-old patient with a branch that uh, with non-risk lesion, you still have to think maybe that patient will be 20, 30 years after fo in follow-up. On the other side, you, you didn't talk much about radiation and performing a CT scan every six months for a patient may be harmful, I think. You didn't talk about MRI. And on the other side, you may say that a patient with a low risk lesion shouldn't have any notice, noticeable changes within two years. So my question is, making a six month CT scan schedule of surveillance isn't a little bit aggressive? Well, we, we certainly, or I would say our general approach is to start with relatively short interval follow-up scanning. Uh, generally, that CT, we've actually modified our CT protocol. We have a pancreatic uh, CT protocol, which is specifically designed for cyst follow-up, which cuts the radiation dose m more than half. Um, so we try to pay attention to that. And then we also do switch to MRI in terms of long-term surveillance quite quickly. I'm more comfortable looking at CT, so generally I'll get one or two CT scans, but then I switch to MRI, which avoids the, the, ta the concern over radiation exposure. I, I agree with you, with a young patient uh, who's going to have 30 years of follow-up, it's difficult to, um, to, to look down the road, and, and particularly if they have an equivocal lesion and say that we're gonna follow this versus remove it, and I think that comes into the equation in terms of whether you recommend observation uh, or surveillance. But, but certainly uh, to subject uh, uh, all of our patients with very small incidentally discovered lesions uh, to pancreatic resection, uh, even though they're young, will certainly uh, commit them to the morbidity and, and potentially mortality of the procedure. So I think it's part of the factor, but, but certainly not, not the only one. And what's the right interval for surveillance, Peter? Yeah, I mean, we generally start off with a short interval uh, just to make sure of stability. And then after one to two years, uh, we go to an annual scan. Now, I don't think we know the, opt the optimal or even the duration, optimal duration of follow-up. But for right now, and certainly for patients with IPMN, um, that's lifelong surveillance. And do you have any person, any patient of yours in which you decided to quit surveillance? After some years, you say, okay, let's do it. You're okay, don't come anymore? Yeah, or, certainly. Or you, you, I, once I, you have a patient for surveillance, it's 
always for civilians. Well, generally I say we'll do a scan once a year and when you get to be 95, we'll stop doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Oh, hi, uh, Shiva J. Raman from Toronto. My uh, question is for Dr. Asplin. Um, I want to preface what I say by saying that I'm someone who does the laparoscopic Whipple, but I suspect a lot of the cynics in the audience are being quiet and not asking questions such as, for example, in pancreatic cancer, when people are living on average two or three years after an oncologic resection, what's, what's the point of a laparoscopic operation? That's probably what they're thinking. Um, and sort of where quantity of life not, may not be so much and chemotherapy is not necessarily so great. So if you could comment on that for the crowd, I think that'd be good. And then my second comment is um, if, again, because of the laparoscopic approach necessitating meticulous vascular dissection, therefore less blood loss, maybe that's translating into a medical oncologic resection by better lymphadenectomy or whatever the case may be, better uh, achieving of an R0 margin, uh, why not do the laparoscopic resection and then do a small laparotomy to do the reconstruction where most of the morbidity and resultant perioperative mortality comes from? Um, I'm going to start answering the, the latter question first. I agree. I mean, there's nothing wrong to do that if that's what, what a surgeon wants to do. Um, always keeping in mind not to compromise the safety or the quality of the procedure, open laparoscopic or robotic. Um, having said that, I don't think we're there yet to decide where are the chips going to fall regarding laparoscopic pancreatic or duodenectomies. It may very well be that the majority of the surgeons are going to end doing that. And it's, it's clear that you probably have done enough because you know that after you do enough, the resection appears to be better laparoscopic than open. It takes longer, but appears to be better. Having said that, I'm going to go to, as a lead with that, uh, to the first question. Um, if there are skeptics still, why are we doing this? Again, I try to emphasize, we're not doing to send a patient home two days earlier. Yes, I did a, lap whip, a laparoscopic whip on Friday, patient went home yesterday, Wednesday. Um, do I feel good about it? Yeah, of course I feel good about it. That's not the main reason. The main reason is to see if we're going to come up with a better operation. I do believe, for example, the mesorectal excision concept, that when we used to put the hand in the pelvis and then they showed that doing a sharp dissection gave better prognosis, we may be able to show that better. There is um, Verbecki, the pathologist in Europe, has done the radial margin studies and shows up to 80% positive R1 in many of the other ones that before were R0 because she's studying the radial margin. And we may be able to prove that and show that's a better operation. The problem, open or laparoscopic, pancreas surgery, as Dr. Allen said and Dr. Parks, it's very difficult to have any prospective randomized trials. Then it's going to take time to decide that. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Dave Levi from Charlotte. Dr. Allen, uh, we need your help. We, we're seeing a lot of these patients that have asymptomatic, incidentally discovered cystic lesions and patients being evaluated for liver transplant. And I'm wondering if anyone else is seeing this. And what do you do with these patients? Or does it change? Do you have any advice in terms of how that plays into it? It's different than the patient that had the incidental finding when they had their CT scan in the ER for their sprained ankle. Well, we certainly see those. Actually, I've, we, in a, and we haven't pulled these data out, but I, I've actually seen a large number of kidney transplant patients post-transplant with diffuse branch duct IPMN really filling their pancreas. And at least in, in, in my mind, is there some sort of relationship between immunosuppression and the development of that process? We have no data on it, but we're, we've seen a large number of those patients. And I think pre-transplant, and we do occasionally we'll see this patient pre-transplant, and uh, obviously I think you want to characterize it as well as you can. I think that's both imaging as well as probably an EUS and cis fluid in that patient to look at the CEA level, see if it's zero or see if it's 400. And if it's a branch duct IPMN, I think all you can do is say that you have a very strong uh, or a high, high likelihood that get, get based on imaging features that there is no invasive uh, cancer there at this time. Some of the recent literature has thrown a little bit of a, a, a thorn in, into that, but, but I think uh, we, we feel pretty confident and we we've, have seen resection of maybe hundreds, I'm not sure yet, of small branch duct IPMN, and we've not seen an invasive cancer in a, in a lesion without concerning features less than about two centimeters in size. Yes. 
Hi, Kevin L. Hayek from the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, thank you all for great presentations. Dr. Weber specifically had a question regarding uh, staging laparoscopy uh, pre-neoadjuvant therapy and whether or not that's been involved in any of the protocols and if that has led to any, you know, detection of metastatic disease either, you know, prior to neoadjuvant. So I think that's a great question. And, um, there's obviously a lot of institutional variation in the answer, and we routinely will um, use staging laparoscopy up front before starting neoadjuvant therapy, particularly for patients with borderline and locally advanced disease. Um, but I think there are many places that rely on their imaging. I think there's still probably 10 or 15 percent of patients when you operate on them after neoadjuvant therapy where you see small volume metastatic disease that you would not have have detected with a straightforward cross-sectional imaging. So we utilize it fairly liberally. Okay, thank you. Hello, <coughs> Ilya Gur uh, from our Sutter Group Medical Foundation in uh, Stockton. P uh, question to Dr. Parks. Um, when uh, you presented this uh, study with a step-up approach for pancreatic necrosectomy, um, the I have a difficulty, you know, visualizing. I mean, we've all been there r removing that, you know, sequestrum, and and this is a tissue that uh, I I don't really see how you can remove effect, uh, you know, effectively through IR placed drains. So I don't have a, a problems visualizing how you can do it laparoscopically or video assisted, but. Uh, I just don't see how this will come out with uh, minimally invasive uh, drains. Um, it, it can, it's rarely done on one occasion. It usually requires a median of three or four procedures. And interestingly, over time, it does break up and the cavity becomes very well uh, matured granulation tissue. It is uh, a bit tedious and, and the pieces do come out initially very small. But one of the advantages of leaving things three or four weeks is you can often get out quite large chunks at a time. Uh, we dilate up to about a 32 French, put a sheath in, and it's amazing what will come out of that. Um, you sometimes, some of our theater staff have described it, you can almost pull the rat out of the hole. It can almost come out in its entirety. Um, so there's no doubt the longer you leave things, the better walled off the cavity becomes. In general, you need multiple procedures. Patients need to go back to theater two, three, four times, but it does come out, uh, and uh, you get a very satisfactory appearance at the end where you're looking into an empty cavity which is well granulated, and there's no more necrotic tissue in it. It, it can be achieved. I just need to convince my interventional radiology to do that now. <laughs> what he didn't tell you is they irrigate it with single malt scotch. <laughs> <laughs> Sharon, I have a question for you. Um, so the patient that you presented is kind of a typical patient that you see that has locally advanced unresectable disease with celiac encasement. Right. Gets full furanox, has a partial response, but still has celiac encasement. Then we typically would radiate that patient. We still see something there. I don't think the radiologist can help us a lot of times and tell us if it's tumor or yes. fibrosis or response. So have you employed... Um, like a, 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 a more aggressive resection, like a modified Appleby mm -hmm. procedure to resect the celiac in a case yeah. like that. And there's been, you know, there's been sporadic reports about that, mainly from Asia, that uh, th that can be associated with long-term survival. So when do you do that? How do you assess what's there in the celiac when you end up operating on these patients? I mean, I think the key thing is that you cannot rely on a response to therapy. And that's true for borderline disease, meaning shrinkage of tumor from the vessels. And that patient that I showed you, although that scan looked horrible, did get preoperative therapy, got chemoradiotherapy, and I resected him, even though it looked horrible. Because I think there are those select patients, and he wasn't one of them, that do have a complete response. If you look at those series of truly locally advanced disease, the resectability rate is 25 to 35%. And I think it is based on a good risk patient who's young, who can tolerate a big operation, regardless of whether you need to do venous or arterial resections, and the fact that they don't have progression at distant sites. And I think in those select patients, although most of them are not going to be resectable, there is this little subset, and partly it's limited again by the imaging, because you can't really tell if it's truly invasive or not, and you can't really tell what the response to therapy has been. So I think in the highly select patients who are young and healthy and can tolerate a big operation, I would operate on them. 
Bill? Hello, um, also from Washington University. I just want to follow up on, on David's question. Um, we, we see what you've shown in those films numerous times, and we have an ongoing disagreement of what does the CA-99 mean in those situations? Does that influence your decision to move ahead to the operating room? Yes. So I think clearly multiple series would say it's predictive of findings of occult metastatic disease and predictive of a poorer prognosis. But I think that single test, if everything else looked like we were moving for the operating room, wouldn't um, halt me from moving to the operating room, but is clearly a negative prognostic factor. I don't know if you have thoughts about that, Dave. No, I, I would yeah. agree. 